Thanks for watching today. Our guest is Brattleboro Memorial Hospital cardiologist, Dr. Mark Burke. And we are in the middle of a series of discussions about your health, what it takes to be healthy, what are some of the chronic problems in the region, and whether you are six or 66, what you can do to help yourself live a longer, healthier life and uh, also take some of the sting of healthcare costs out of your wallet and the community's wallet. Dr. Burke, thank you a lot. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. I keep <coughs> seeing these reports out of the state of Vermont that says we're an obese society or more than we were in the past whatever number of years. Um, a lot more people have cholesterol issues uh, that need <coughs> or they, uh, that the medical community says desire treatment and that cardiac problems are one of the leading causes of death in Vermont and around the country. Uh, given all of that, it sounds like you've got plenty on your plate. Right, there's certainly no end of work, um, and um, which I suppose in some ways is good for me, but uh, sadly also is bad. Um, the the, the uh, incidence of heart disease, as you mentioned, is going way up, and the sort of the pipeline of heart disease, and how many people down the road are gonna develop problems is also going way up. Um, and sort of as part of that, one of the things we've gotten good at is helping people survive when they do have a heart problem, which then sets them up for a new set of problems five or 10 or 15 years down the road, which they would not have otherwise had because they wouldn't have survived. So we've, uh, we've in some ways created a problem for ourselves um, and we have not addressed the fundamental problem, which is how do people get there to begin with? Um, and, and for the majority of people, um, the way they get there is how they handle themselves. People put a lot of stock in their genetics. Um, it turns out genetics don't count that much. Uh, they certainly count, uh, but they're not nearly as important as the environment. So, what people, so it's what people do to themselves, how they behave, and what happens to them. Those are the things that actually, in the end, make a difference. Um, a very simple example is people talk a lot about longevity. My family is long-lived, or my family is short-lived, or whatever. Um, genetics is about 10%, explains about 10% of the length of a person's life. Um, and 90% of it is environmental. It's how you've behaved, how you've taken care of yourself, or what's happened to you. What are some of those <clears throat> behavioral factors? Um, I presume you're talking about weight, exercise, um, rest, diet, that sort of thing? Yeah, so you can sort of name them uh, in their fundaments, um, but you know, sort of the items that, 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 that are essential to, the, to causing the problem, but the thing that actually, the, the, the overall explanation of how they actually end up being mixed together is really complicated. So the biggest problem we have in our culture is that we eat too much. We eat huge amounts of food. Um, but what drives us to eat is complicated. And um, um, it's very simple to tell someone how to lose weight, for example. You eat less and you exercise more. Um, but it, it turns out that what drives a person to eat and how they lose weight what their bodies do in terms of the, what their bodies do with those calories is, ex is extremely complicated. Um, so it's not, it's not so straightforward. So uh, to get back to your question, um, so a lot of what drives it is, is yes, diet, um, is lack of exercise. We've, um, since the turn of the 19th century, have become a progressively more sedentary culture. Um, the degree of sedentariness didn't change that much in the early part of the 1900s into the uh, late 1900s, but what really did change is, our, is the ability of high caloric um, food there were the availability of high caloric food that's prepackaged. And, and so obesity and overweight started spiking in the 50s when that kind of food started becoming more available. Um, so exercise clearly plays a role in that, um, but it's not the only piece of that. And diet is a very big piece of that. And then there's all the cultural parts of it. Um, you, you, uh, earlier we were talking about how um, uh, um, a family a mother might be overweight, and then the kids tend to be more overweight, and um, there are environmental things within the family that, that change that are very hard to address and that lead to a lot of these problems. So 
as I sit here, a guy in his mid-50s who uh, is like the rest of the world, you know, you, you take cholesterol medicine, your doctor tells you that you want to reduce the incidence of, of uh, um, heart attack or heart disease associated with a high cholesterol count. Let's, let's break this down. What role does cholesterol play in all of this? What causes it? And uh, should this be a concern to us? Um, yes, it should be a concern. Um, what causes it is, again, it's multifactorial, so it's, uh, it's genetic. So in this case, genetics do play a, a larger role than perhaps in longevity. Um, and it's environmental and it's how we eat. So it's, 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 it's a multiplicity of explanations. Um, for many people who come to our office, um, it's, it's one of sort of two general explanations, which is it's a very powerfully genetic uh, coupled with very poor diets. And um, so can it be controlled? Yes, it can be controlled. Some people, though, can starve themselves completely and still end up with very high cholesterol because their body just makes the cholesterol. Um, do they all need to be on a statin? Maybe or maybe not. It kind of depends. It depends on the person. It's very individualized about how you do that. So when you are uh, looking at a person's cholesterol number, is a number that important? And what does it mean in terms of what health problems they might be seeing down the road? Well, so numbers at either end of the extreme are clearly important, but the numbers in the middle um, are become relative. So, um, uh, but someone who has a, you know, a, a fairly high total cholesterol, 300 or 400, that's, you know, for a cardiologist, um, that makes me quake in my boots. Okay, you know, that worries me. Um, and how they got there then depends on what we do about it. Um, you know, the first intervention is always to try to change your diet and improve exercise. That unfortunately rarely works for some of the reasons we talked about earlier, because it's hard for people to do. It doesn't mean they shouldn't, or, or, and it doesn't also mean they can't. It just means it's hard. Um, so that's the first bit of it. Yes, it, so... Uh, uh, numbers that are intermittent, intermediate, it's, it's really kind of where you're in the gray areas that it becomes an issue. So extremely high or extremely low, it's pretty easy to know what to do. But when people are sort of in the middle of where a lot of people fall, it kind of depends upon who they are. So if you have sort of one of these mid-range values and you're a diabetic, uh, well, then that's probably too high. But if you're a mid-range value and you run marathons and you have no other health problems and you're 45 years old, then probably we just tolerate it. So when do drugs become something that doctor and patient consider? Are they effective and are there potential side effects? So the drugs are very effective um, and very safe. Um, there's a lot of mythology around what these things do and can do and, you know, um, uh, but they do also have side effects. Um, the, the incidence, there are different kinds of heart attacks, um, and the worst kind is called a ST segment elevation MI, which we abbreviate STEMI. And the number of STEMIs has reduced by 25% in the last 10 years, primarily because of statins. So the, and so those are often fatal, or if not fatal, very dangerous and debilitating. So that risk has come way down just by, by dint, probably, of the statins. So, and, and you're talking about statins. I'm sorry I brought that up without saying what they are. That's okay. But those are the drugs that we use to treat them. That's sort of the class name. Um, uh, and, they, and they do have side effects, potentially, and you have to monitor for those things. But, you know, some people need it. Everybody needs water, and everybody can drown in it, too. Um, so uh, for some people, it's essential, and you have to be aware that you could drown in it, and so you have to moderate how you use it. A lot of the statin drugs that are out there, the Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor, this tour, that, that tour, uh, it almost seems like they are more pushed by the pharmaceutical industry and the ad agencies than they are the doctors. How much does one play into another? Well, so, I mean, that, that's a problem. I mean, the so-called direct-to-consumer marketing has created a big problem for me because people see something on TV and they want the latest and greatest, and everybody wants a pill, unfortunately, because a pill's not always the answer. Um, so they see the latest and greatest, and then they pressure me to give it to them. Um, and I don't 
I don't give in to those pressures, but at least not usually. <laughs> so, um, uh, so they do play a role, um, and and they also influence you know um, physicians as well. Um, they influence some of the the studies, but if you're careful and you know how to interpret these things, and you're a reasonable person, you think you can sort of sort through some of the some of the dreck that's out there and, and get to the real bottom line. I mean, some of these drugs <clears throat> for a person without health insurance uh, would cost them hundreds of dollars a month to be able to purchase if they were on them for a maintenance situation. Th that's, that's very true, and that's unfortunate. And you know, you could go to Canada and get the same drugs for a lot less. But also, it turns out that many of the same drugs are available as generics, and there you can go to Walmart and get them for $4 for 30 days or $9 for 90 or $10 for 90 days. Um, and they're just as effective. So I, I tend to prescribe mostly generic things when I prescribe anything. And, um, I should tell you what my favorite prescription is. My favorite prescription is um, go for a walk and eat right. What does eating right mean? What, what kind of diet should someone who is okay either overweight or has a cholesterol situation be looking at? All right, so that's a very good question. And um, mostly it's portions, right? There's clearly food that's not healthy, but it's really, at the end of the day, for us, for our culture, it comes down to portions. We just eat too much. Um, so, but even within that, obviously, you know, foods that are high in saturated fats or overly processed that have lost a lot of their nutritive value uh, and only contain caloric value are not helpful. Um, so, you know, a good diet is what everybody knows is a good diet, which is a lot of fresh food and limited processed food. That's a good diet, coupled with appropriate portions. Okay, so are these sorts of things absolutes? And do you tell somebody that, well, you shouldn't have this, you shouldn't have it at all, or you, sh you should have it very seldom? Right. Um, so is it absolute? No, nothing's absolute, except death and taxes. Um, so the, uh, um, still by and large in terms of weight comes down to portions, right? So uh, the, one of the problems with, with diets, so I'm gonna sort of move away from that, from your question a little bit and maybe All circle right. back. One of the problems with diets is that diets don't work. No diet works. Every crazy diet out there, from the Atkins diet to this diet to the coffee enema diet to whatever diet you're on. The coffee what? Yeah, when people <laughs> do strange things. Um, they all work in the near term. That is, people eat less and they lose weight. But they don't work in the long term because they're not sustainable because people don't like them for the long term. So you have to like what you're eating. So when it comes to an appropriate diet, you have to enjoy it. And if you're going to make the changes that you need to do, which mostly comes down to portions, but also moving away from calorically dense food and, or calorically empty food, um, um, is you have, to, you have to like what you're eating. And so you have to work with that. So um, in our culture, we're a meat-based culture. We eat lots of meat and we eat huge portions of that meat. And um, so do you need to eliminate meat completely? No, you don't need to do that. Um, I had a friend who called it his 90% rule. So 90% of the time he did everything just right he had a heart attack, and 10% of the time, you know, he reserved for himself. And, and that worked just fine, and he did extremely well. Uh, and he had many other issues, which we managed to control by, you know, sort of accommodating his, his desire to feel that he still had some control over his diet in his life. And part of this in, in my business is that people end up feeling they've lost control. And so what's something they can control? They can control what goes in their mouth. And so they decide to eat this thing, and that makes them feel like they've got a locus of control. And they do in that moment, but then they lose control over time. So you have described yourself as kind of a life coach. How does uh, <coughs> one role of physician and the other role of life coach intertwine with one another, or are they separate? No, they're inter intricately intertwined. And, and uh, it's very hard to separate the two out, at least in the kind of work that I do, because um, I've already said several times that the most important thing is how you take care of yourself. And so what I, if I want you to not have, uh, to be healthy, or at a minimum to have a smooth ride for whatever time you have left, um, I know that 
taking care of yourself is important. So finding out what the barriers to those things are is critical. And there are many barriers, and there are social and economic and, um, and psychological. There, there are many things. And so I, I need to at least be involved in that to some degree or another. Yeah, you, I mean, you can tell someone <laughs> that they need to eat fresh fruits, but they may not be able to afford them. Right, right. And, and so it really is working with them to find out uh, what can work best for them and keep them healthy. Right. So um, another example is, so walking, I mentioned, is a very powerful prescription. Um, so there are people who live on main roads who have limited mobility themselves, and there's no shoulder in the road, and there's really no place for them to walk. You know, so they have to drive someplace to walk, and that's hard to do, especially if they have poor vision um, and they're not comfortable behind the wheel of a car. So, you know, I mean, there, there are many, many barriers. Right? And, and, and if you give me a barrier, I have an answer. I have an answer to everything because I've heard every single excuse. Um, and my answer may not always work, but I've got an answer. So um, there's usually, there usually is some way around it. It's not always a convenient way or the best way, but there's usually some way around it. I like that. So do people come see you earlier and earlier, or do you end up seeing them with your specialty where sometimes some damage already has been done? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I clearly see them when damage has been done. So when the, when, you know, the horse is out of the barn. Um, but then in, uh, I do get to see people before problems have developed or, um, because they have, you know, they've had a scare or they're worried about a symptom or whatever. So, so people come in who are basically healthy and I, and I get to um, at least have some intervention early on to help maybe at least begin getting them thinking about what they can do to stay that way. You mentioned that sometimes uh, heart issues have other related uh, maladies, some other health conditions may be involved. Can uh, having some of these uh, perhaps make your heart condition worse? So you mean like you have other like diabetes? Yeah, let's say like if them? it's diabetes, uh, uh, perhaps uh, um, lung problems or some of the other related sure. issues. Sure, they all, they, they, and they all interact. And um, so um, uh, a classic one is uh, that I deal with is sleep apnea. So what is sleep, I don't treat sleep apnea, I identify people who might have sleep apnea, but what's that got to do with anything? Well, so when people have a untreated sleep apnea, every problem they have is 10 times worse than if it's treated. Um, and what happens when they have sleep apnea? They're tired, they're fatigued. You know, they work all day, they're exhausted at the end of the day because they're not sleeping well at night. So are they motivated? They may want to go out and exercise, but they can't. They just don't have the ability to. And so what do they need to do to stay healthy? They need to exercise, but they can't because they're tired, they're not sleeping well. Um, and then they have all, other, all the other issues that come on with life and social stresses and you know, the banks after their mortgage and whatever. So, um, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, you, you did mention <coughs> sleep apnea as one related matter. How much is having the proper amount of rest going to help you stay healthy? And what is the proper amount of rest for somebody? The proper amount of rest is when you feel rested. So, um, you know, an average person needs somewhere between six and nine hours of sleep. Some people need four hours of sleep and some people need more. It turns out people who need more sleep tend to have more problems down the road. People who sleep less tend to have fewer problems. People who sleep on average have the average amount of problems. And what kinds of uh, things does excessive uh, caffeine consumption do? I mean, we, we seem to be pushing coffee as a nation or, or uh, grab a soft drink to keep yourself going. You see these uh, commercials that say uh, this five hour thing will help you get through your day or get through your night or start your yeah. day. It'll also make you more beautiful and rich. Hey, yeah, how much of that is too much? Uh, rich? Uh, well, the other. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, rich creates its own problems. Yes, it does. Um, so, so, so let me just back off by back, right. uh, back up a little bit by saying caffeine gets a very bad rap. It doesn't really deserve. Okay, so by and large, moderate consumption of caffeine is okay. 
um, a couple cups of coffee, whatever, you know, a full strength coffee, two, three cups is not the end of the world. Um, in fact, coffee is probably good to you. There's almost all the literature about caffeine and coffee are that it's healthy. But just as I mentioned earlier, with water, which you can drown in, you can also have too much. So you, and I have seen people who drink too much and see the consequences of that. Um, so, you know, these um, high energy drinks that are promoted that people um, are, are probably really ultimately very bad. And part of the reason they're bad, in addition to the fact that you're getting a huge jolt of a drug that you probably don't need, is that it also, if, um, caffeine has a very long, it lasts very long in your body so that it, it affects your sleep. And when your sleep is affected, then your health is affected. So, um, you know, college kids staying up all night is an example. But a real example for adults is, you know, shift work. People who don't sleep well, people who do shift work, people who are third shift often have a lot of health problems because it's really not healthy. So we should uh, all just maybe turn the lights off and, and go home for eight hours? Or how do we uh, right. navigate these things? Right, sure. Well, except you got to pay the bills and you that's have to right. go to work. So, so, <laughs> so you have to deal with it. And, and so that's where it gets hard. And there isn't, for those kind of things, there's not really necessarily a very good solution. And some people, they work, you know, third shift, they sleep four hours and they get up and they work some other job part time because they got to pay the bills. And, um, and, and that's, that's very hard. And, and there's, and for them, there isn't really always a good solution. And I, I, you know, you can't make that part go away. So, so really, it all boils down to life choices, what's more important, and when you make those choices, how do you deal with some of the other ancillary questions that come in? Right. So, you know, it's, it's very uncommon for me to say to someone, you should not work or you should retire. Um, I almost never say that. But I, there are occasions when I do say that uh, because... The alternative is, you know, declining health and well-being, and and really it's about the well-being that's more important. And and some people are really suffering, and if they have the ability to change that, so people who are on the cusp of retiring, who have already set themselves up to retire, maybe retiring a year earlier isn't the end of the world, um, or changing jobs, or just instead of working three jobs that you, you know may, may help you buy the extra car, maybe you don't need that third job. So sometimes I, I, I say that. I mean, mostly work is important to people. And so I, I don't want to ever remove that from people. So how does someone look at, at their own health situation? When should they start getting checkups? And in case they don't feel right in some way, shape, or form, when should they see uh, a cardiologist <laughs> such as yourself? So most, most people um, have a, a, a regular physician who they go to, and, and it's that person's job, that physician's job, to, to identify um, incipient problems, problems that are cropping up, uh, and then get them to the right person or for, or for the primary care physician to take care of that issue itself. Um, so most of my work comes from, is referred from, by other doctors. Um, but, you know, some people show up at the door because they're worried, and that's what we're here for. I mean, we take care of problems, and, and, I, and I like those kind of problems. When people show up that have, they're worried, and it turns out they're okay, because then I don't have to be the bad guy and say horrible things. I can just say, you're okay, when that's kind of nice to do once in a while. And the, the reverse of that is someone may have a heart attack. <clears throat> they enter the hospital, and they get referred to you. What does their aftercare involve, and uh, uh, how much of, uh, of uh, that can be controlled? So the nice thing about my work is that a lot of what happens to people can be controlled. Even if you've had a heart attack, you still have the ability to shorten the odds of a second event. There's no guarantees, but you, you know, most people come to me, if you look at it in terms of odds, they've got their bets placed on the long shot which if you place your bet there, you rarely win, but you might. Um, so I try to help them shorten those odds. And if you bet on a sure thing, you still might lose, but it's not like betting on a long shot. So people can control things. And um, so the aftercare after a heart attack typically is going into cardiac rehab, which is an educational, 
program with supervised exercise, and the program here at Battleboro Memorial Hospital is great. Um, there's a lot of individualized attention. Now, people go, people successfully uh, go through a rehab program, reduce their risk by about a third of the second event. And the reason it's only a third is the recidivism rate, that is going back to the way you were, is pretty high. So if everybody took the message to heart and kept it, then the number of people who did better after cardiac rehab would be even higher. Um, and then um, sort of the maintenance phase of what happens after rehab program, getting, depending on what's happened to a person, you know, there may be a complex uh, drug cocktail that has to be administered, or maybe it could be quite simple. Um, uh, and the next phases after that are sort of getting into the maintenance phase and making sure it doesn't happen and constantly reminding people and helping people along in that process, in the journey. And it's a journey. It doesn't end. How much of dealing with some of these questions is having the right attitude and a positive outlook on yourself? People who are sort of inherently have a positive attitude seem to do better generally than people who don't. But there's a range of personalities in terms of how people approach the world that's also kind of inbred. And um, um, you can't artificially change your outlook. That, or it's very hard to do. That sort of that feel good part of our culture, um, I think ends up creating more problems than it solves. Uh, so I'm, I'm, it, it, it's very important and, and trying, to, trying to get your head around what's happened to you and dealing with it is very important. But if you're someone who's sort of gloomy in general, you probably aren't gonna be somebody who's not. And um, because that's what your nature is. So you have to work with that all right. We all are brought onto this earth and we, we all pass from it exactly once. And what we do really is, is up to us in large part. It is up to us. And so, you know, I mean, some of us, are, I think, are more able to, to take control of that and, and some, of us, some of us are less able. Um, I think ultimately all of us can. Um, um, right. So it is a lot of what we make of it. But still... Um, the idea of people having this very positive, rosy attitude about everything isn't realistic. And, and further, you know, when people have, especially when people have suffered a, a bad event, um, it's scary. And the psychology of that is to be scared. And it manifests itself in many different ways. And being open to the fact that people are frightened, I think, is really important in, in, in how we deal with things. Because they are. Definitely. And, I'm sorry, go ahead. Dr. Burke, I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. So did I. Dr. Mark Burke, our guest today. Thank you. And again, you can find out more about how to take care of yourself, improve your own health and well-being. Go online to bmhvt.org. This is Tim Johnson. Thank you for watching.